All right, let's bow our heads now as we transition to the sermon time. Father in heaven, thank you for this moment and our worship time where we can participate together, not just through my words, but through our ears and our hearts, and we give you permission to be in this place, to lead us, to direct us, to inspire us. Move me out of the way. May we understand clearly your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Eternal truth and misinformation, part one, a two-edged sword. You know, it seems like now more than ever, we are experiencing situations where what we used to trust is no longer trusted, where we second guess the information or the source. It used to be we would trust journalists. Journalists take a vow, a pledge, a code of ethics to be trustworthy, honorable, unbiased, to to consider the circumstances, to be truthful and accurate, to have objectivity, and to faithfully report the news, to hold those in charge and leadership accountable. In fact, you can learn a little bit about this and check out pointer.org. Yes, that's pointer with a Y instead of an I. No affiliation to my family, but the Pointer Institute of Journalism world-renowned in training journalists because they're set up to be a champion for freedom of expression, civil dialogue, and compelling journalism that helps citizens participate in healthy democracies. We prepare journalists worldwide to hold powerful people accountable and promote honest information in the marketplace of ideas. So even with all of that, All it takes is someone to stand up and say, it's lies, it's fake news, and then we start to second guess that used to be credible source of authority. Well, that's not the only place and situation. Medical doctors, now it seems that people will take the advice of political pundits, news talk show hosts, over a medical doctor for something like how to control an infectious disease. And then leadership. It used to be there was more numbers of trusted elected leaders that we could trust in to bring us reliable information to lead us forward and to uphold and proclaim it as good information. Now it seems That might not be a requirement for election because it seems that many are not able to function in that capacity in leadership. They no longer have astute discernment or maybe the voters or both. Thinking critically is not as common as it used to be, which helps perpetuate misinformation. So this misinformation abounds in all realms. I mean, you've heard about the pandemic. Yeah, you've heard about it. You're all wearing masks. And wild ways to treat it. In Oklahoma, this deworming medicine normally used for horses is off the shelf. You know, there's the human version and the horse and bovine version. But the human version, I guess, was out of stock. So people were using the horse version to try and treat COVID-19, and the FDA had to release a statement, stop, don't do that, that's not advised. But somewhere, someone proclaimed that they found a reliable source that said otherwise, and so this misinformation is perpetuated. The Genesis 2 Church of Health and Healing in Florida has a cease and desist order by some legislature, either the FDA or Florida, to stop selling bleach as a COVID cure, among other remedies. They, they claim as divine he- ointments of healing. Destructive. Don't do it. Don't believe in that church. So it's no wonder people are even mistrusting churches and faith-based organizations when institutions like that are trying to lead people. Well, I get it. 
No one wants to follow a source that you thought was trustworthy and then find out it's just all folly. The information was not valid. There was a mistake. We lose faith and trust. Like the first time Alicia and I took our SUV off-roading. Now, it's the first time we took it off-roading. It's pre-owned, so I don't know where it's been prior, but it's the first time we took it off a paved road using the GPS, going to a family member's house I hadn't been to before, up on the way to Lancaster on the 15 north after the north of the 210. There's this new community, and Waze is telling me to proceed north down the road. There's no street signs. I don't know if it is the right road or not, and the pavement is gone. It's just dirt and rocks. Turn left. So we turn left. And then we begin to wonder, should we proceed? As that road begins to go down a hill, so we stopped. It was too steep. I mean, it, it was one you'd want to ski down, not drive down. And because it wasn't paved, the rainstorms had worn a deep rut in the middle. It didn't look safe. So rather than believe in the GPS, usually a trusted source, we decided to turn around and backtrack through the paved route. So I get it. Sometimes the sources we thought were reliable, it seems confusing. And so we want to go to the right source. That's the point. That's the point I'm trying to make. We want to go to the right source for our information, for eternal truth, for essential life-saving measures, and all things that are important in life. How do we do this? How do we navigate this? Well, we want to go to the right source because we wouldn't want to go to our podiatrist, our foot doctor for oral surgery, right? No. You wouldn't want to get your gastroenterologist to perform brain surgery, would you? No. Would you want your ophthalmologist to give you advice on infectious disease? No. You want to go to an infectious disease expert. So we listen to the right sources amongst the context of sources as well to get our advice in living, in navigating. We want to trust and verify. Trust but verify, as Ronald Reagan famously was quoted as saying. It's not blind faith. So we trust, we verify, we try it out, we move forward, we begin to hold it in high esteem, and then when misinformation abounds, we go back to those moments we verified. Well, it was accurate here, might be accurate again. We continue to trust and verify. Today we have a situation, in fact it's a serious situation, where misinformation is pulling people away from eternal truths. Now we are here today because of eternal truths we hold dear, amen? We are here because we believe in the Bible as a source of eternal truth and it contains everything we need to have effective hopeful, loving relationships, and a meaningful life, and salvation. Amen? We are here today because it has led us to this moment. It's a source of eternal truth. However, trust in these eternal sources is starting to wane at serious levels and proportions around the world and the country. This trusted source for spirituality and religiosity is now waning. For instance, the Bible, this is from Barna. The Bible, this is the question that they polled. The Bible contains everything a person needs to live a meaningful life. Now, naturally, you're going to say yes. Amen? You're going to say yes. Well, last year in 2020, Sixty-eight percent said yes, 68 percent of, of America. So of the poll, they extrapolate, of Americans, 68 percent believe the Bible is everything we need to have a meaningful life. But in one year, that slipped 
14 points. Incredible, to 54%. Now let's look at how many actually read the Bible. Last year, daily reading was only 11% of the population. Now, we wish it's better, right? Well, get this. Those that only read it three or four times a year or less, so they believe in the Bible that it's a valid source for a meaningful life, that it's a reliable source of information, 58% only read it three or four times a year or less, even not at all a source of eternal information. It's so awesome, yet people aren't even reaching out for it. And in the world, 87% of countries that were studied became less religious over the 12-year period that was studied. So very recently, there's a huge decline in religiosity in countries. America moved from number one during this period to number six in the world at being religious. And church attendance is now below 50% for the first time in American history, even in the course of the pandemic. So trust is waning, yet people want to trust. We want to trust. We want to have a meaningful existence. We want to have purpose. We want to understand where our information comes from and, and, and have reliable sources and, and confidants and, and leaders and inspiration and guidance, right? All age groups, even the millennial generation and younger. Now, the CEO of the Edelman Corporation, which is an international marketing company, every year they produce their trust barometer. Well, the 2018 numbers indicate that trust among the general population from 2017 to 2018 dropped about nine points from 52% to 43% in one year. Notice those years. That's before the pandemic. During a time when things were going fine. Joblessness was down, the economy was great, yet trust plummeted the most significantly at any time that this barometer has been produced. I'd hate to see what it is now. Trust in government during that same time period also plummeted from 47% to 33%. So we want to trust, but we're grasping at straws to find reliable sources to trust in for our guidance. Whether it be trust in the U.S. government or international leaders and so forth. But we're here today to trust in God. Amen? We're here today to uplift that what we trust in, His Holy Spirit. He Himself in the form of the Holy Spirit and His inspired Word, the Bible. It gives us purpose and meaning and we believe this. Yet there are times when those that doubt the Bible, the Bible, as we've already laid out, there is a mistrust in the Bible. There's a lack of use. It's not prevalent. It's not in the forefront. And other used-to-be-trusted authorities are second-guessed as misleading or inaccurate or fake news. And so there's a lot of questions. And it's no wonder that what we hold as essential and valid and trustworthy, others can't seem to fall in line. So how do we handle that? How do we help them with their questions? How do we safely navigate in a world of eternal truths and misinformation? Because they move along in life together. They're everywhere. Eternal truths and there's misinformation to make people doubt. There are times where we struggle on how to answer, when is it the right time, how do we do it tactfully, how do we respond, and how do we move away from being I'm right and you're wrong to leading someone to Jesus, not getting bogged down in facts and figures, but leading them into a relationship. Yet when they approach us with questions of truth and accuracy and verification, we want to do that in a tender way. So how do we navigate this safely? I was approached with this one of many times, but it was in my younger days at Fresno State. 
California State University, Fresno, and at that campus, and I'm sure other campuses in California that are state-run, have free speech areas or quads. Do they still have that? Cal State, Long Beach, Irvine, UCLA, all that? Well, at Fresno, I liked hanging out there. But I realized what happens. I got approached by some religious folk thinking I wasn't religious in my long hair and who I was hanging out with, I guess. And so they sat down and said, what are you doing? They began to approach me about their religion and their belief. And do I believe I'm saved? Will I live forever? Will I go to heaven? And then they began to get into some beliefs that even though I wasn't really practicing and reading my Bible daily anymore, I had fallen away from my reference point. I didn't know how to respond. I couldn't debate them if debate was in order. I, I was beginning to wonder, what is it I believe in? And can I even believe in it anymore? These seem like valid statements, which I realized they were way off base. So in that free speech moment, I realized I had very little speech to offer because I was disconnected from my source of information, the eternal truths of Scripture. And when we're disconnected from our reference point or when we're coming at it from different reference points, it makes it really hard to have a conversation, doesn't it? When someone's reference on religiosity, religion and spirituality and things like that comes only from Google, and we're coming at it from the Bible. Now, Google has, there's a way to use Google to get to authorized sources, of course, no doubt. They're trying, as I remember Jesus speaking about in, in a communications meeting, I think, that Google's mission is to gather all of the information in the world and catalog it. And that's powerful. But you've got to know how to use the tool. And then we have the tool of Scripture in all its forms and publications, right? So we have to have the similar reference point. How do we answer questions about the rapture and what happens after you die and the second coming and the Sabbath as we're studying in our Sabbath school quarterly? It's difficult to influence and lead someone into our eternal truths when we have separate reference points. But reference points are essential. We're concerned. We're, we struggle about this as our children, as our friends, as our family navigate life in a world of eternal truths and misinformation. What will they find on a Google search about our church, about my name and your name and Christ? Will it be accurate? How do we help them put aside the misinformation? There is a proliferation of misinformation out there, not just on YouTube videos and the internet, but in the bookstores as well and in the analog formats. It's difficult to influence when we have a different reference point. So how do we safely navigate? I bring this question up again. How do we safely navigate this world with our eternal truths and lead others beyond misinformation? Do you think the Bible has some answers for us today? Do you think? Yes. Amen. It does. That's the point of this sermon series. Pastor Peter and I will be leading and presenting over these next 13 weeks how to navigate this world, how to see our eternal truths again in a new perspective or in a complete comprehensive view, seeing Christ in them and how to connect people with it through our way of living and believing and upholding. Amen? So our reference point is essential. Any of you have been snorkeling? I know many of you like to snorkel when you have a chance to travel, right? And if you've seen anyone snorkel, or even if you've been swimming anywhere, when you've got your head in the water and you're swimming, after a while, if you don't pay attention, you lose track of where you need to be on shore when you get back, right? You realize you're way out to sea. I mean, it's fun. The water's warm. The coral's great. You're like, whoa, I've gone really far. Where's my family? So whenever I'm snorkeling or playing out in the waves, I have to keep a reference point. Maybe you do this too. That umbrella that's ours. Hopefully it's not everybody's Costco umbrella and they all look the same. You get that reference point so you don't drift too far away. So you can come back. So you can 
orient yourselves. Do they still teach orienteering and pathfinders? I remember I got that honor. You get your compass, you aim for a mark ahead, you see it, and then you can meander around and go around the hills and through the terrain and get back to your point without getting lost. You keep that reference point in view. We need our reference point in view all the time. And I declare this reference point is the Holy Spirit and his word, the Bible. Amen? God speaks to us through these sources, to our hearts through the Holy Spirit, to our hearts through the power of his holy Bible in all its capacities, not just the printed in all the translations and all the ways we reference it. Amen? This is our reference point. So before we look at a few things about God, eternal truths about God, we need to answer a few of the controversies that come up that you might hear. Like, well, how can I answer my friend who doesn't believe in Scripture as we do? They don't hold it up as reliable. See, God communicates to us through it with the power of the Holy Spirit, so we need to have answers. We need to internalize these reference points that allow us to have faith in Scripture. Does that make sense? Because when someone presents misinformation or you find it in a Google search, you wonder, well, that seems wrong. That, that seems inaccurate. That seems incomplete. That seems out, out of context, so you go to your reference point. So we're going to look at point and counterpoint a bit, okay? So I hear this very common when I even had that question of myself when I was much younger, when I wandered away among my friends, even some family. How can the Bible be reliable? It was written by human beings. Don't human beings make mistakes? They're fallible. How can the Bible be reliable? It was written by humankind. Aren't there mistakes? How could it be trustworthy? Well, this is a reference point to counter that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture, in other words, Scripture itself, is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen? In other words, yes, human beings wrote the Bible. Prophets spoke their words. Scribes wrote it down. Even some of the prophets wrote it down. But they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They had a different reason and objective and purpose for writing, not to uplift themselves or their king but to uplift God through what he inspired them to write. So this is the framework. This is the foundation of all of our counterpoints. Yes, humans were involved, but the Holy Spirit had his way with these people. For instance, these prophecies, look at these prophecies. In Isaiah, it speaks of the fall of Babylon before it happened, and it happened. Ezekiel speaks about Tyre falling, great city, and Sidon falling, and indeed, they are still fallen. Babylon was prophesied would not be rebuilt. Saddam Hussein tried, but he's failed. He's passed away. Cyrus, it was prophesied, would restore Jerusalem, and he did. He made the decree. It, the Bible prophesies the rise and fall of Medo-Persia and Greece and Jesus' birthplace. Just, this is just a spattering. Landing on the most important, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So these prophecies, proven historically as well, Jesus' birth, his life, death, and resurrection has impacted the world among all religions and locations on this earth and even, even caused our calendars to change, B.C. and A.D. Amen? Impactful historical records that corroborate Scripture written by humans inspired by God. But there's other 
pieces of evidence that help us cling to these eternal truths. So I'll go through it quickly. The Moabite stone, a monument depicting the Moabites' victory over Israel. Of course they're going to do that and brag to everyone around. But inscribed in it, it speaks about the fall of Israel and the victory of the Moabite king as recorded in 2 Kings an extra-biblical artifact that verifies the writings of the Bible. Awesome, awesome stuff. The Lachish letters. These were letters written on pot shards, which is a very common way to send messages in ancient days. And there were about 12 of these with inscriptions depicting the events that were happening before Nebuchadnezzar finally conquered Jerusalem, what they were doing to protect themselves, to try to avert destruction, noting King Nebuchadnezzar in this. Awesome, corroborating the rise and fall of Jerusalem and Babylon. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, no, they're not scandalous. They're actually the greatest archaeological, biblical find in Earth's history thus far. Countless scrolls from the Qumran Essene community in the arid Middle East preserved with all the Old Testament books, with the exception of Esther, proving, showing how accurate the scribes were in meticulously hand-copying each scroll of the Hebrew Bible. When one wore out, they'd redo it. When someone needed another one, they'd make an exact copy. If they made a mistake, they destroyed it. And here we have duplicates, examples to show not only how the language was accurately translated into Greek and other languages, but also that the Hebrew text is intact. Amen. Cyrus's cylinder here also proclaiming his victory and decree to allow all those in captive lands to come home, which corroborates what we find in the Old Testament. The Rosetta Stone. You've maybe gotten a subscription to learn other languages, right? Well, this was a monumental piece of information which has helped us understand Egyptian language, hieroglyphics, Greek languages, all inscribed on this stone that helps us confirm the contemporary language that was in use at the times the scribes wrote which also helps us understand how accurate our modern-day Bible is. Not to mention, there's a cohesiveness in the Bible. So the accuracy from the Dead Sea Scrolls helps confirm that no wonder the Bible is so cohesive. From old to new, the golden thread of Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation through a holy line of people from the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ who will come again because he died victoriously, a sinless life, rose again, will come back, and we have everything we need to be ready for that day, amen? amen? And the cohesiveness of this story is marvelous. I mean, how could you have the conglomerate of letters be so unified? We can't even do that in our educational systems with textbooks covering history accurately, and we're all still alive to report on it. Or get a news story straight, yet the Holy Spirit was able to work through imperfect people to make a perfectly acceptable document. Amen? Because the reference points are all there. The cohesiveness, not to mention, all the scandals are still in the Bible. I tell you, some places are like rated R, PG-13 at least. The scandals, the murder, the intrigue, the sabotage, the gossiping, and they hold true to today in the language is so applicable and the stories so perfect as illustrations to lead us. And so John 5.39 brings in here not just the accuracy, but the greatest thing that this reference point for us that we hold as eternal brings. What it, what it does, the purpose of it, not just having these facts and confirming the language and the culture and the cities and the circumstances, but the greatest thing that Scripture brings out, its purpose for you and me and that which why we are burdened to 
keep this reference point in view and put aside the misinformation so we have even more faith in this. And that is this. John chapter 5, verse 39. Examine the scriptures since you think that in them you have eternal life. They also testify about me. Who's writing this? This is the red letter section. Jesus is speaking. This is the purpose of Scripture, to teach us about Jesus. Amen? They testify about Jesus, and something amazing happens when, that, when we get into Scripture. And you found that that's what's led you here to today, to today, to this moment. It's impactful. Hebrews 4.12 describes Scripture as a two-edged sword because God's Word is... It's living, it's active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, that's different than a single-edged blade. Single-edged blades are great for swiping and chopping and slicing. A two-edged sword is specifically designed to pierce and penetrate, to go deep. So specifically, the Bible, it penetrates to the point that it separates the soul from the spirit. It gets to the heart. It gets right into the middle of our lives, into our minds, to the joints and the marrow. It, it gets right in there. It's able to judge the hearts and thoughts and intentions, and that's what happens. We read the Bible, and it starts reading us. We start seeing the facts are true. The historical evidence is there. The prophecies hold true, so the other information must be true. I remember when this hit me and my wife right between the eyes, sitting in an evangelistic series. You know, it wasn't so impactful at that point in my life because I had already been baptized. But for her, she's like, what? I'm going to have to change my life. I'm going to have to give up this lifestyle and put down the cigarettes and put down this and that. And, and she said, I want to box the pastor's ears. Don't like hearing this, right? Amen, she's been converted and changed. But see, what happens is like, how could this be true? And you don't want it, but that's how the, the spirit motivates change. And so she went out. I forgot to bring it out of my office, but she went out and bought, unknown to me, I was home in Virginia, a book on history to find out if indeed the timeline of Nebuchadnezzar's statue of the rise and fall of the kingdoms was indeed accurate, and sure enough, and so on and so forth. That sword of the Spirit was piercing her heart and my heart. But there's more to this that helps us have this reference point. Some might say, well, you can't believe in the Bible because how could there be a worldwide flood? Evolution depicts life as millions of years old. Just look at the geologic column, and it took thousands of years for each layer to be created, and the fossils are simple life forms at the bottom and more advanced at the top, which shows the theory of the evolution of the species. Well, that's just one side of the coin, isn't it? Because there's evidence that says to the contrary. When the Bible says that God created through his word in six days, and on the seventh created the Sabbath, and then when humankind fell, he was so angry, it got so bad, he sent a worldwide flood. Why, indeed, the geologic column can also say, and it does, it says a different picture. Fast fossil burial. Rapid fossil burial. How could a layer of dead animals lay on top of the earth's crust for 100,000 years and still exist? I don't know about you, but when you find a, a dead animal in your backyard or a roadkill, how long does that last? Even if you didn't pick it up. It would be gone about a week, decomposed. So how could a fish lay there for 100,000 years eating another fish right in action? It's... it's frozen in action, and this other picture is of, uh, of a fish giving birth. Rather, this shows rapid fossil burial by a worldwide catastrophe, global at the same time, rapid sedimentary development. I won't even go into how Mount St. Helens shows that forests can be petrified in 20 years. 
not millions of years, much faster. So it blows a hole in all of those theories of the origin of the species and the evolution of life forms. The dark day in 1780, Revelation proclaimed the moon and sun would not give its light and that the stars would fall, recorded in 1833, prophecies fulfilled. These reference points give us hope and courage, and they give us the markers to keep having faith in the info we've not yet verified, that archaeologists have not yet discovered, that there's portions in some of your young time studying, you're just starting your baptismal classes, you haven't read the whole Bible from cover to cover yet, right? Yet you can still have faith in it because it's most important. It's not private interpretation. The Holy Spirit works through this book. All scripture is profitable. The purpose of it, the purpose is to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in our life development. Every scripture is inspired by God, amen? It leads us, it instructs us, it helps us understand right from wrong. But we need to use it properly. How do we use it properly? Well, you need to read the whole thing, right? We try that. But even before you've gotten through it, it's a little overwhelming. So when we study about a topic, when we're looking for Christ in the Old Testament, when we're analyzing things, well, we do line upon line. Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. To whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are just weaned from milk, those taken from the breast. In other words, we need to grow into our understanding of Scripture, give it a chance, and have a methodology in our study, a study habit, a pattern. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. We stay in context. We need to. This is essential. The reference point is for spiritual living, salvation, connection with God. A wholesome living, a productive life. But it's not a comprehensive guide to every decision in life, right? It has a couple recipes in there, like unleavened bread, but it doesn't tell us how to, to bake our Sabbath lunch. It doesn't tell us what school to do, but it guides us into where to go for trusted resources outside the Bible. Amen? But we got to be in context. For instance, you could, and this is from my friend James Wibberding, but you may have heard other similar out-of-context Bible studies to prove a point, sometimes humorous. But this one I got a kick out of, Pastor Peter and I. We sat in on a seminar. And here's the context. In Genesis, humankind were created to be naked. They were unclothed, and it was good. But then you move along into the New Testament, and Peter speaks disparagingly about clothes and jewelry and, and garnishes over our body. And then in Revelation, you see that the pure church, signified as a woman, is clothed only in the sun, naked. And the unpure church is clothed in clothing of purple and scarlet. The conclusion, the pure church should be naked. We should be naked. Oh, we laugh and... Fortunately, that's just a joke. Thank goodness we wouldn't want to have to be the church of the unclothed Adventist church. That's a study out of context, completely out of context. Does it make sense? But every one of those statements was true. The description, but not the prescription or the point. We need to be in context. And thank goodness the context can be found because it speaks in language that's still pertinent today. I find this awesome. Every time I read through the Bible cover to cover, I'm like, I read this story last year, but I didn't see that point or I forgot about it. Like all of the terms that still are pertinent to today. As if we think that they were some ancient society that was not evolved and didn't have etiquette and culture. 
Isaiah 28, 17, they had engineers. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line, but hail will sweep away the hiding places of lies and water will overflow the shelter, the plumb line used to make sure your walls are straight and everything is sure and upright. That's awesome. We still, you can go down to Harbor Freight and get one of these today. 1 Kings 5.17, at the king's command, they quarried huge stones of the finest quality in order to lay the temple's foundation. My stepbrother had to spend much money to restore his home built in the 1800s because they forgot about this ancient essential technique of home building. It was built without a foundation, so it was sinking. They had to lift it up and put a foundation under it foundation, old but still current. Even boxing, I already brought this up in another series, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Paul speaking of subjecting our bodies to diligence and practice like a boxer. Even the inn was full. Motel 6, the Holiday Inn of biblical days. Not much has changed except that the Bible holds true. It doesn't change. Amen? It is assured even the tax collectors of the olden days are feared today. As Jesus sat with tax collectors. So in closing, I share this. When you get a cookbook, you try a recipe, right? Those of you that have tried to cook, you know, I, try, I dabble in that every now and then. So you try the recipe. Wow, this is great. Then you try another recipe, and it doesn't quite work out. Do you throw the cookbook away and throw the whole thing away because it didn't work out? Maybe not immediately. No, you, maybe I did something wrong with it. Maybe I didn't understand what it meant. The ingredients or whisking or stirring or searing and so on and so forth. So we give it a chance. We work with it and we learn to use the cookbook. We don't throw it out when something doesn't make sense. We should be the same way with the Bible. Give it a chance. Hang on to the recipes that work until you get an understanding of that which you've not dug into yet, a recipe you haven't tried. When we watch a movie trailer, we're curious about the movie, we watch the trailer, and oh, yep, you can make a decision whether you're going to like the movie or not by watching the trailer, right? That's why they're designed for that. But then after you watch the movie, you're like, you know, why'd they leave that out of the trailer? I mean, if they had put that in, I definitely would watch the movie. So these reference points in Scripture lead us to more truth. They lead us forward. Hold on to these reference points. Use them. Share them. Give them to others to reel them in and to what you have found pulled you into the desire to find Jesus in it, to use it as a trustworthy source. Book reviews, book excerpts on the back cover and the inside leaf. You read that and you can decide. We judge a book by the cover. That's how you're supposed to do it. That's what it's designed for. Gives you a hint, but it's not the gospel on the book. But you read the excerpt and then you start digging into it. So this is a reminder. Continue to dig into it. Don't lose the reference points. In a world of eternal truths and misinformation, stay connected to your essential reference point, the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Amen? As we do this, then we continue to use the recipe book. We continue to get more information to paint a great movie trailer to someone who doesn't hold the Bible as trust, trustworthy just yet. We then have more answers to our questions. We have more faith in it. We begin to try it out more, and then we internalize it, and we're not led astray. So we keep studying, we keep praying, we keep trying it out, and we keep focused on Jesus Christ. And then guess what? He becomes more clear. The Holy Spirit's power in our life becomes evident. The sword of the Spirit, that two-edged sword, begins to continue to have the permission that you give it, the Holy Spirit, to make change. 
to give you courage, to know exactly what to say, when to say it, when to just preach in deed rather than word, and when to preach in word and deed and, and just word, and what to say when nominating committee calls you, what to do about planning your afternoon for October 30, how to get involved in mission and vision, how to get creative, how to dedicate time to those who mistrust the Bible, who haven't even picked it up in years. Stay connected to these eternal truths, I pray. Let us pause for prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that you continue to unite us around these eternal precious truths. Thanks for reminding us of all the reference points that are validated, that help build us up. So we aren't running blind, and at times when we lose sight, we can still navigate back to you. We're not led astray. Give us courage, clarity of thought, to stay in context, to attend how to study the Bible meetings and planning sessions, and how to be an effective witness with our story, to present a clear movie trailer of, of Jesus' work in our lives, to give a review of the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us in this endeavor to stay committed to Jesus and your holy word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.